All right, everybody ready for some word today? If you have your Bible with you, get it out. If you have your Bible apps, get them on, opened, and on airplane mode. Hallelujah! Thank you, Lord, for no distractions. All right. Uh, if you would, turn with me to, well, you want to find the book of Acts chapter 24. Acts chapter 24. Now, I started a new series just a couple weeks ago. And this series is called Heaven Yes, Hell No. Amen. So, what's our subject? Can you figure it out? It is a, a series about heaven and hell. It is about eternity. It is about the afterlife. It is about not only uh, what happens when people die, but our mentality that we should have while we're still here on the earth being uh, eternity-minded. All right? And so when, whenever we discuss these matters, the absence of us being able to take a tour or you know, have a first-hand encounter without the Lord's assistance, you know, uh, we, we're not going to know everything about, about either place, but we can know some things. And, uh, and really, we can know a lot more than I think the average person realizes they can know. However, there's a lot of misinformation about heaven and about hell that is out there. And some of it is just tradition. Some of it's came, you know, it originated in our own mind. Some of it came from someone very creative who made a movie or wrote a book or something, and they, uh, you know, poised certain concepts and ideas, and societies, has, societies have latched onto them. And, uh, and sometimes they might have some, some things right, but I want to go to the Word. I like to go to the Scripture. What did Jesus say? What are the Word? Of, what, what's written in the, in the Bible about these places? So I have a, an authoritative source to know what really is. And uh, like I shared with you last week, uh, Paul the Apostle made a statement in, in Acts chapter 20 where he said, I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. All right? That means that there are things shared that are delightful and pleasing, and I can't wait to hear it. And there are parts of truth, parts of reality that we should know about. They, they don't necessarily make you shout, you know? They don't necessarily uh, make you want to, you know, dance and run. <laughs> but they're still true, and we should, in, to some degree, be guided by, or our thoughts, our decisions in life should be shaped by reality, okay? And if something exists, it exists whether I acknowledge it or not. If something is true, it's true independent of my feelings or thoughts or knowledge of it. So I just want to come into a greater knowledge of truth, of reality. I want to know what thus says the Lord about these very important subjects, now, uh, when sharing the gospel, I don't think we should ever start with hell. That's, that's not my method. I don't believe that would be biblically supported, that, that our primary message is a negative one. Our primary message would be about punishment or suffering. No, just the opposite. The, 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 the gospel is called good news. The gospel is not called bad news. Now, the existence of good news doesn't mean there isn't any bad news. It just means it's not our primary message. We're always going to major on and focus on the love of God. We're going to preach about Jesus' sacrifice for our sins, tell people what can be, not just what can't be. And, and, and so we always start there, but, uh, you know, sometimes it would be right and appropriate to include a full discussion. Not every time is it needed up front, but sometimes we got to bring in, uh, you know, what happens if someone rejects the good news, because that's also the case. That's also true. In fact, if you would there, look in Acts, Acts chapter 24. If you're new with us or new to church in general, you're not familiar with the Bible or these verses, uh, you know, listen the best you can. And if you have the ability to look at these things with us, it would be uh, most beneficial to you. Uh, what was happening here in Acts is this is when Paul, as the apostle, Paul's kind of a big shot in, in Christianity. Uh, 
Uh, he wrote large portions of the New Testament, and he was a bold proclaimer of the good news and truth, and he was highly persecuted as a result of it. And at this time in his life, he was working his way through the court system because he'd get in trouble for preaching. And, uh, and thank God we're not that place in our country right now. Uh, we're, we're getting in trouble for preaching the good news. It's true in some parts of the world, though. And in his case, he was now standing before a governor, a guy named Felix. And I want to read uh, just this part of it in Acts 24, verse 24. It, it reads, And after some days, when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, who was Jewish, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. What's his discussion? The faith in Christ. Now, as he reasoned, now just hold on for a moment. So Paul, his approach here is reasoning. Is, is it okay to reason with people? Yes. To use logic, to use your brain, to have a discussion, right? There's times when the gospel goes out like in this setting where I'm doing all the talking, all right? But how many know most of the time when God is discussed, when Jesus, when salvation, forgiveness is discussed, it's not in this, a setting like this. Most of it is conversations people have right? And it's smaller groups or it's one-on-one, -on -one, uh, and that's the way it's supposed to be, right? But in this case, he reasoned with him. So he's just talking, using logic, discussing what the Lord has said. He's not just, you know, saying, you're going to hell. <laughs> he's reasoning about three things, though, he mentioned about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come. So as he discussed these things, righteousness, self-control, and what? Judgment to come. What was the response? What, did, how, what kind of effect did that have on Felix? Can you see? It didn't really make him happy. It goes on to say, Felix was afraid and answered, go away for now. When I have a convenient time, I will call for you. So some of what Paul discussed did not bring joy to the listener. It actually brought fear. He was afraid. Would that mean that it is also true for us today if we are speaking the same gospel message that Paul preached, that sometimes it would have this effect on the hearer? I would have to say, if it never has this effect... We're leaving something out that he kept in. And that's a real temptation in our society where everything's good news. Everything's just happy, happy, feel good, feel good. But some parts of the message might make people scared. Could that happen today? Yes. Yes. Say, so do we want that? Well, I'd rather, I'd rather the Felixes of the world receive the Lord. And how many know, if you receive God's mercy and grace and forgiveness and love, there's no need to be afraid. There's no need to run. There's no need to say, I'm out of here. I, I'm not listening to this. But it is when someone rejects the good news, yeah, there's judgment to come. That needs to be known as well. And I think if we really love people, we do include that. Yeah. First, no. Not the foremost message, not the primary message, but judgment to come at all? Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, obviously, you can see here what Paul did not preach. You know, Paul is known, if you read the things he wrote, in large part, he focused on redemption, on who we are in Christ, on the grace of God. He had a great revelation of new life in Christ. And if you read his writings in Ephesians and so forth in, in uh, Romans and, and Galatians, you'll find out, man, this is shouting ground. This guy preaches the good news to the max. He is a good news preacher. But notice what Mr. Grace also included in his, in his discussion with the governor. Judgment to come. So that would be a part of a balanced message of the gospel to speak of righteousness, yes, self-control, and the judgment that is to come. Everybody okay? Listen to this. Um, some preachers 
some quotes I, I had come across. Warren Wearsby said, A group of servicemen asked their new chaplain if he believed in a real hell for lost sinners. And he smiled and told them that he did not. Then you're wasting your time, the men replied. If there is no hell, we don't need you. And if there is a hell, you're leading us astray. Either way, we're better off without you. <laughs> That's logic. Billy Graham. He said, I am conscious of the fact that the subject of hell is not a very pleasant one. It is very unpopular, controversial, and misunderstood. As a minister, I must deal with it. I cannot ignore it. And you know, his, if you know, if you've heard, of, heard of Billy Graham, what was his message? Salvation. He's an evangelist. Win the lost. And that's what he said. What about Jesus? Did Jesus discuss the subject? Well, again, we know Jesus as the one who wouldn't condemn the woman caught in adultery. We know Jesus, of course, as the Savior, the one who gave his life for us on the cross. And he is love personified in the flesh. It is Jesus, the Son of God, right? Do you know that Jesus spoke about hell more than anybody else in the Scripture? In fact, there are 46 separate verses where he mentioned it. So this was not outside of his preaching, of his teaching. And I think, again, that warning someone of impending danger is an act of love. It's like uh, the bridge is out. If the bridge is out and the car is coming, the person who really cares about the person in the car, or get, they're going to do whatever they can to wave that person down and to stop them from going over the cliff. Yeah. And if we love then we also are aware of, of these matters. Amen. Amen. Now, in the book of Jude, you ever read Jude? <laughs> hey, Jude. <laughs> What's the next line? Don't make me sad. Is that right? Something like that. <laughs> I don't know that. The, I don't think that's the same Jude. Uh, but Jude said this in verse 22 and 23. He said, and on some have compassion. That's an interesting statement to even say that. Have compassion on who? Some. Well, Jude, don't you think we ought to have compassion on everybody? No, he said some. Some have compassion making a distinction. But others... Save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. Okay, there's a right proper motive and time for hate. And that is the figurative language there used of, of sin or anything that touches evil whatsoever. He said, some have compassion. What do you mean there? I think the message is primarily love and forgiveness and, and what the Lord did. He said, but others, they're not listening to that. Can I just add this in? Uh, some others, they're not receiving that. So what you need to do is shake them. Amen. What you need to do is do a little Felix reasoning and tell them about judgment to come. He said, some people are going to respond to that. Many people are going to respond straight up to Jesus loves you died for your sins, you want to receive him, yes! And others go, well, eh. you know, I would wonder if we took a poll, and this is not negative on either side of this, just understand where I'm going, uh, how many of you who are already believers uh, got saved because you loved God? Because you just wanted to please the Creator. You just wanted to serve the Father for all the days of your life. And you just wanted to do God's will. And so as soon as you heard of His plan and salvation and eternal life, you said, sign me up. And I wonder how many of you said, well, the reason I got saved is because I didn't want to go to hell. <laughs> And we might think, I don't want to admit that. I don't think there's any problem with that. I think that's pretty smart. 
Now, obviously, we don't want to live a life of fear. You want to get beyond that motive into a relationship with a loving father, and, 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 and he wants to be close to you. But there's no doubt in my mind that lots of people are in heaven and will go to heaven, and their primary motive was they didn't want to go to hell. And I think that's kind of smart. You know, I avoid negativity all the time if I can. <laughs> I mean, or negative situations. If I'm driving down the road and, and it looks like there's a traffic jam and I see I can turn here and get around it, I'm doing it. Why am I going to go sit in traffic, you know, if I can avoid it? And, and, and to avoid negative things in life, I think, is a natural response. And maybe that's part of the reason why we have so many verses in the Bible that deal with the negative side. Some are motivated by just the compassion and love of God and how he helps us. And some say, you know what, I just really want to avoid that. Either way, come on in. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Let the Lord work in you and change your life. Praise God. Yeah. Now, uh, if you would, go to the book of Luke and the 16th chapter. Just a left turn if you were there in Acts. Luke, the 16th chapter. And, and I want to read an account that Jesus gave in his teaching about a guy who was just referred to as a rich man and another guy named Lazarus. Now, before I get into this, it's kind of a graphic story of, so, of two guys who died. And Jesus told this story, but I want to preface it with, with this. In some circles, this has been controversial because people have not, want, wanted, not wanting to look at all the vast number of scriptures that deal with uh, uh, the afterlife in a negative way, they, they have said, well, Jesus was using a parable here. He wasn't talking about an actual event. Wasn't talking about reality. And uh, although Jesus did teach using parables many, many times, in this case, he's not using a parable. Here's why I can say that. Uh, first of all, he mentions specific people by name in the story. Abraham, Lazarus, so forth, right? In parables, that was not the case. He wasn't using real people, all right? Secondly, we can also see that uh, Jesus ascribed specific sayings when he said, Abraham said this, if this is just a parable, Abraham didn't really say anything. And so he would be, you know, putting something on him that was, you know, fake news, <laughs> right? Abraham didn't really say that. You ever been misquoted? Have you ever had a story written about you in the newspaper? They got it wrong, I bet. <laughs> not that I have much experience, but a little bit. And, uh, and not negative, not, not like trying to harm us, but, you know, we've had stories written. And I've, I've been put in quotes. The pastor said, I, thought, I didn't say anything close to that. <laughs> and yet there it is. That's just a side note. Whenever you watch, whatever you watch, whatever you read, do so with a skeptical eye because likely it is wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> That's just a fact. Sometimes it's intentional and many times it's not. It's just, they just make mistakes. And uh, let's get back to the story. Start, start getting me off on all that. <laughs> this is a real story. By the way, if it was a parable, why would Jesus teach a lie with a parable? Teach about something that wasn't even true. So this is an actual event. These guys are in existence right now, today. One of them's in a good place and one of them's in a bad place. Right now, it's true. This is an actual event that Jesus is talking about. And he said in verse 19, Luke 16, 19, there was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. Now, that's maybe not be the language that you use, but I think it sounds pretty good to fare sumptuously. <laughs> he said, but verse 20, there was a certain beggar named Lazarus full of sores who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed the, with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. 
the rich man also died and was buried. So stop right there for a moment. We can see, first of all, how many know whether you're rich or whether you're poor, you're going to die. <laughs> we have some things in common. The rich and the poor, they are both going to come to the end of their physical life and they are out of here. So both of them died. This is interesting to me. When, when a saved person dies, you know who they get greeted by first? Angels. Angel. That means if you're a believer, when you step out of your body, there's, someone, there's going to be someone there. There's going to be angel, angels there waiting because you are, you know, royalty. You're someone of great importance. You're not just going to heaven on your own. You're going to be escorted. Yeah. Sir, could I take you in? Ma'am, could I? I'd like to escort you right in. We've got a special place for you. And they're going to walk you right into glory land. Yeah. Yeah, so that's pretty cool. We get escorted by angels. But when, when unsaved people die, there's no one there. When the, when the unbelieving die, they just go to hell. There's no personal escort. They're just there. That's what he said. Verse 23, see, in the end of verse 22, the rich man also died and was buried. Verse 23, and being in torments in Hades... He lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. We'll get to that in a minute. But he died and he's just in torments in Hades. Okay? And notice he wasn't at a party. And the rich man died and the party just started. And the music was great and his friends were there and they were living it up. Thankful that they didn't have to be in that boring place called heaven. By the way, we're going to fix that concept next week. Yeah. And that one will be more fun than this. <laughs> Guaranteed. <laughs> but, but that's what the, the situation he was in. He was not in some kind of party. He was not having a good time. No, he was in torments. Verse 24, then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Now, now consider his, his condition. He is conscious. He didn't die and he's just, you know, brain dead, soul's kind of sleep where he's just kind of, you know, non-conscious of what's going on. No, he's fully conscious of his surroundings and they're not pleasant. And it's interesting when he says this, and he asks about, could I, get a, could I just get a little drop of water to cool my tongue? If you're asking, why don't you ask for like a way out of there? Yeah. Abraham, why don't you send Lazarus over here? Could he, get, could he throw me a rope? <laughs> How about a ladder? Could, could you get me? A, he's not even asking that. It tells me. It, it makes me think that people who are in hell, they know they're supposed to be there. That when reality sets in after this life, there's no argument as to deservedness or guilt. He's not asking to get out of there. He's not asking, he's not even asking for much, just a drop of cool water to touch his tongue. And so he was conscious. It can see here conversations take place there. People still, still do communicate Verse 25, verse 25, but Abraham said, son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot and those, uh, nor can those from there pass to us. Okay, let me explain the, the, the layout of the land in Hades at that time. Hades, by the way, remember we defined that for you uh, last time, was not all negative. In this time, this is before Jesus, obviously Jesus is telling the story, so this happened sometime back. Could have been thousands of years, could have been recent, but sometime before his death, resurrection, uh, death and resurrection, okay? In that time, Hades had at least two compartments, right? One of them was a suffering side. One of them called Abraham's bosom. Not sure why it's called that, but it's like Abraham's lap. 
But it's, all, it, it, it's, a, it's a comforting side. That, that place is also referred to as paradise. All right. You, you might recall Jesus on the cross. He was having a discussion with the, the criminals next to him where one was jeering at him and the other said, uh, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, uh, I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. Par where was paradise? At that moment, it was beneath. And so the layout of the land, I, you know, it, it basically two spots with a gulf between them. A, I don't know, my mind goes to like a canyon, like the Snake River Canyon, but I don't know. I mean, it was obviously they could communicate across it. Isn't that wild though? You got people suffering over here and you got people, they have water for sure, but people in paradise in great pleasure on the other side. And they could communicate across Wow, very interesting. And so before, say, why, why, did, why did they go there? Didn't people go to heaven? No, they didn't. Prior to Jesus being raised from the dead, people, no one went to heaven. They couldn't go to heaven. You understand why? Why people couldn't go to heaven is because they were spiritually dead. Jesus had to come so we could be born again. Remember, unless one, John 3, 3, is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. No one was born again prior to Jesus being raised from the dead. Therefore, no one could see the kingdom of heaven. It wasn't, it wasn't about God keeping them out. It was about you're still spiritually dead. And until the final sacrifice is made and Jesus' blood is shed for all, you're still dead. So we have to kind of put you somewhere. And so paradise was beneath the earth. Paradise was a compartment, a place in Hades. And there are, I don't know how many people, but many, many people were there. I sometimes go in my imagination what it was like. When someone dies and they're waiting for the Messiah, waiting for the Savior of the world, but they, I don't know how much they knew and how much they didn't know. Maybe, they, maybe when new people showed up, they're always asking. Because people are coming in every day and they're showing up. Did he come yet? Did he come yet? Did the Messiah come yet? Did the Savior of the world come yet? And they're waiting for information and you go through and, and you know, maybe when Zacharias showed up and he said, I had a prophecy. I think, it's, I think it's right around the corner now. Maybe they're finding out information, but it is getting ready. And then one day, of course, you know what happens, is uh, Jesus shows up. Jesus shows up and, and, and he, he, he tells them, he preaches the gospel. By the way, here I am. You've been waiting. I'm here. Savior of the world, right here, right now. I bore your sins. I paid it all. And he gives an awesome salvation message to a multitude of people down there in Abraham's bosom. And he said, on three, lift your hands. One. <laughs> two. Didn't he? Did, don't you think he did? Three. Bam. <laughs> hands went up. Oh. And every single person in paradise got born again as they received Jesus as their Savior. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah. Yeah. And say, so, so how do we know? Well, Ephesians chapter 4 says he led, when he descended, he led a multitude of captives out of there. That means this, this was one happy day when gazillions of people got led out of paradise. Or basically paradise was brought to heaven. We'll see later when we discuss these things that paradise is a word used in heaven now. And so all those people got to go in the presence of God because they were born again. And so now there's no longer those two places in Hades. There's just one. All right, let's keep going. You guys are getting too happy. This is, you're supposed to get happy next week. No, I'm kidding. Uh, Luke chapter 16, then verse 27. Then he said, I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers, uh, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham. But if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to them, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be pers persuaded, though one rise from the dead. It's interesting that there's this notion that if people see an outstanding miracle, they always get saved. 
they always give their life to the Lord. They don't. There were many people in their day, people in our day, who know God is real. They know what the gospel is. They know what's available to them, and they still reject. Okay? But isn't it interesting? Someone, if, if someone thought, uh, you know, I don't know, if, I don't know if we should use that. I don't know if we should talk about hell. It's like scaring people into, into heaven. Well, this guy was in hell, and he was wanting more people to preach about hell. Right? This guy was there. He said, go tell my family about this place. He wasn't, he wasn't anticipating their arrival, saying we can get together and catch up. Can't wait to see him. He said, no, I don't want them to come here. This is bad. And he knew the finality of it. He knew there was an, it, it was an absolute decision. There's no discussion about it. You're just stuck. He said, tell them I don't want them to come. He wanted us to talk about, well, us. Someone to go to his family, but he wanted people to know about that horrible place. And so, you recognize that this is not a teaching that uh, rich people go to hell and poor people go to heaven. Because, I mean, you, don't, you can't take that and, and excuse everything else that was taught by the same person <laughs> and, and come up to that. But one thing you can see in, in some of this is the reality that if someone, even if someone is highly successful and wealthy, materially successful in this life, there's no guarantee that's going to last. Right? There are many people who have put all their eggs in one basket, so to speak. They've poured themselves into just natural success in this life and have achieved it. And this life is over in a minute. And it's really not going to matter. And it also tells me that even if someone has suffered greatly, even if someone has not experienced God's best while they're here on the earth like Lazarus, it's not going to matter in a minute. Because in a minute you're going to be in glory and you're not going to care. In a minute, it doesn't matter what you didn't have then. It matters what you do have now. There's a, an old minister... Maybe you've heard of him named William Booth. He was the uh, founder of the Salvation Army. He said this, Most Christian ministries would like to send their recruits to Bible college for five years. I would like to send our recruits to hell for five minutes. <laughs> that would do more than anything else to prepare them for a lifetime of compassionate ministry. Wow. Wow. I pray that this knowledge stirs our hearts. Amen. Not to, not to use it as some kind of fear tactic, but yes, a warning, but a seriousness where we can't overlook, of course, our own lives. You're responsible for your own life, me for mine. I don't want to overlook people and just, hey, they're having a nice life. Well, what a good they have, and ignore the reality of forever. This has got to be a part of our prayers a part of our conversation, a part of our motive to invite people to church, a part of our reason for sharing and serving people uh, in any way possible. We're looking at everything we do to get an inroad. If I make a lot of money, can I use some of it to help someone get to heaven? If I have an opportunity to serve someone, can I do it with the end result? I'm investing in eternity. Amen. If I have some time to pray while other people are, are living their lives you know, fully devoted to inconsequential matters. Could I stop for a moment and turn everything off and bow my knee and pray that the gospel would be sent out, that laborers would be sent out into the harvest fields? Amen. Amen. I know sometimes people get, you know, that angry at God even for making a hell. How can he do that? How can he be so mean? It's the same God who sent his son to give people a choice. It's the same God who sent his only son who was tortured. He went through a brutal death so you and I would not have to have hell as our future. He made a way when there was no way. This is the same God, and he's more holy than those who make prisons on earth <laughs> that we don't give any fuss about. Amen? He put it in our hands. I want to read this last scripture. And then we'll finish today. And then we'll come back, we'll come back for heaven. 
It's Revelation 21 and verse 6. And he said to me, it is done. This is Jesus talking. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give the fountain of water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things. And I will be his God and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake with, which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Hallelujah. May that first part make us shout. May that latter part make us cry. And be moved to help people. Amen. Thanks for watching the Life Church YouTube channel. You can join us live right here on YouTube every Sunday morning at 9.30. If you enjoyed today's message, share it with a friend. And don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any Life Church videos. For more information about Life Church, check out lcboise.com. Have a great week, and we'll see you next time.